Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. I'm Paul Tursellini, and in this episode, we'll begin our module on heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, or HVAC. This episode will focus on defining efficiency of a heating system. In our building envelope module, we talked a lot about how heat is lost from a building when it is cold outside. The reverse of this is also true. When it is hot outside and cooler inside, heat enters the building. To maintain a constant indoor temperature, we need to add heat in the winter to replace the heat that is lost. If we don't, the building temperature will decrease. And in the summer, we need to cool the building, which is really the process of removing heat from the inside of the building. If we don't do this, then heat will continue to transfer from outside to inside and the building temperature will increase. Typically, we accomplish this with heating and cooling systems. These systems need energy in order to operate. The operational energy consumes fossil fuels and uses electricity. And that electricity needs to be generated by something. As we saw in an earlier episode, those electrical generation sources are typically natural gas, coal, nuclear, and some renewables, including hydropower. The heating and cooling system is designed to keep the interior of the building at a comfortable temperature. And the range of temperatures that we are comfortable at is fairly narrow, typically between 70 and 76 degrees Fahrenheit. We will talk more about the complexities of comfort in another episode, but for now, we will strive to keep the inside temperature within this narrow band. To save energy and its associated costs and environmental impacts, we need to reduce the amount of fuel and electricity that is used in the building. We will talk about this in terms of winter, but the same holds for summer. In order to save energy, we need to minimize the amount of heat transfer through the building envelope. That reduces the amount of heat that the system, the heating system, must replace. Why do we care? In general, we are concerned about the environmental impacts of fuels, including electricity that are consumed by heating and cooling systems in the building. We also tend to be concerned about the cost to operate our buildings. There's also the heat that is rejected into the environment. All the fuel we burn and the electricity that we consume ultimately ends up as heat that leaves the building and enters the environment. To maintain comfort in a building, we need to look at fairly small time steps. We will look at the energy added on an hourly basis from an operational point of view, but we'll aggregate this over the entire year when considering overall impacts and cost. For these small time steps, we look at energy consumed over the one hour time step. That is really a measurement of power that can be represented by Q dot with units of power. We're trying hard throughout this course to distinguish between power and energy as the terms are often misused. To be honest, we have often questioned our use of the words as we put these episodes together. A single small time step indicates a rate such as BTUs per hour or power. When these time steps are grouped together to express a longer period of time, it indicates the amount of energy such as BTUs as energy is power times time. While the math is very clear and instant in time is power, we tend to measure that instant in time as time steps. It is the difference between calculus and mimicking calculus as an approximation of time steps. Let's start with the heat that is added over a small time step. In our building envelope module, we calculated the heat transfer. But to refresh our memory on that, we can say that Q dot represents an instantaneous heat transfer rate. And it's equal to the U factor times the area times the difference in temperature from inside to outside of the structure. We've spent a lot of time talking about how to calculate U and A. And delta T is going to be based on the inside temperature minus the outside temperature at that moment in time. That moment of time is often an hour. If we want to know how big the heating system needs to be, we want to keep the house comfortable on the coldest day of the year. We'll call this a design condition. It is the worst possible case needed to keep the building warm. From that, we can calculate 
what the rate of heat transfer would be during that period of time when it is coldest outside. The calculation tells us the amount of heat that the building's heating system needs to provide at that design condition. Now, there are other methods of calculating the design heat transfer, which account for things like the mass of the building and the ability for the furnace to recover from a lower temperature inside the building, and trying to bring it up to a more comfortable level. But for the moment, we're going to think about it as being the simplified form as just providing heat to maintain the building at a constant comfortable temperature. So looking at our picture of the building, it's really just an energy balance. We've talked about the heat going out of the walls, out of the windows, out through the ceiling, as well as exfiltration. We need to take all of those and add them up. We then need to replace it with the heat that is coming into the building through the heating system. Where does that heat come from? Typically, it is through combustion of carbon-based fuels, like oil, propane, or natural gas. Even though the conversion from chemical energy to heat is nearly 100% efficient, there are some losses associated with removing the flue gases. These gases need to be removed because they would be toxic in the building. The term energy efficiency compares the power that enters the furnace to the useful power that leaves. We use the term power here to represent the rate of fuel that enters compared to the rate of heat that leaves the furnace. As we move forward in this module, we will have several ways to express this efficiency. They all come down to the useful output compared to the input. Typically, the way to identify the input is to look for what we're actually paying for. Looking at this equation, I can take the input and multiply it by the efficiency in order to get the output. The output is determined by the heat loss from the building. So for a short period of time, this is the heat transfer rate we calculated a moment ago. If I increase my efficiency, then the output is constant, but an increase in efficiency will reduce the input and hence reduce the amount of fuel we have to purchase. So let's take a look at our building example again. And this time I'm gonna put my furnace here in the corner of the house. Let's say this furnace uses natural gas, which comes into the house here, and I've got heat loss happening through different parts of the building envelope. So I need to balance that heat loss with the heat being added to the inside of the house from the furnace. We'll call this Q furnace. Let's say that the efficiency of our furnace is 80% or 0.8. If I look at the equation for efficiency, it is equal to the useful output divided by the input. And remember that the input in this case is natural gas, and it's what I'm paying for. So it's going to be the Q of the furnace coming out divided by the heat associated with the fuel content of the natural gas. If we assume that 100 units of heat of natural gas go into the furnace, the 80% efficiency means that only 80 units of usable heat comes out of the furnace. The other 20% then is somehow lost. Most of that goes right up the chimney in order to get rid of the flue gases. If I can increase the efficiency of my furnace, say, to 90%, I still need 80 units of heat coming out to maintain a comfortable temperature in the house. With the efficiency now equal to 90%, our calculation shows us that I need about 89 units of heat from the natural gas going into the furnace. So I have saved 11 units of heat by increasing my efficiency from 80 to 90%. This equation can apply both for instantaneous efficiency, which is calculated at any moment in time, or it could apply for a long period of time, for example, the entire season. From a terminology point of view, the short-term efficiency is the thermal efficiency. Over the course of a season, the efficiency of the furnace will change depending on how long it runs and how many times it has to turn on and off. Furnaces are rated on a seasonal performance or a representation of how it would do for the entire heating season. This is because the efficiency has a big impact on the cost. So we want an accurate representation of the amount of fuel used per year and its associated cost and environmental impact. The AFUE, or Annual Fuel Utilization Efficiency, 
represents an efficiency for the entire year. It is defined as the annual amount of heat going into the house divided by the annual amount of fuel going into the furnace. Note that this is still the useful output divided by the input, or the input that we pay for. Both thermal efficiency and AFUE are dimensionless, which means that the units for the numerator and the denominator need to be the same. So we've spent most of this episode talking about the efficiency of a combustion-based heating system, but I want to take a moment to look, about, look at electric resistance heating. This type of system is where electricity, a form of work, is converted directly to heat. Since there are, is no combustion, this process has a thermal efficiency of 100%. But as we saw in an earlier module, this is not the full story because generating electricity requires combustion at the power plant that has inefficiencies associated with it. And even if the energy is from renewable sources such as wind and solar, it is not the best use of electricity to directly convert it from electricity to heat, as we will see in a future episode. As an assignment, the next time you go to a store, look at their collection of electric space heaters. They range greatly in price, and they will all try to convince you that they are better or more efficient. And at the end of the day, they are all 100% efficient. And for normal household outlets at 110 volts, they are limited to 1500 watts based on typical power limits for residential wiring and circuit breakers. To summarize, heating systems take heat from a high temperature, generally from combustion, and through heat transfer, move the heat to a cooler temperature or the space you're trying to condition. Combustion requires that flue gases be removed, so a portion of the heat input is also lost to the environment. The efficiency is the heat that is useful divided by the energy that goes in, typically in the form of energy content of the fuel. We'll cover more details on HVAC in other episodes, but please let us know if you have any questions or comments about this episode. And as always, thanks for watching.